when you tell yourself that you should be doing things to look after yourself then you just feel guilt about the fact that you're not doing them and so what I've been able to do in the last year 18 months two years is teach myself to have a lot of kindness and grace for myself and I think that's really where I'm at at the moment and that's something I really recommend to everyone listening is sometimes you just got to do what you can and let go of that guilt and that sense of what you should be doing and do what you can and anything else is a bonus. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Simmer Stories. I'm your host, Claire Oldham-West. I hope you're well, hope you're nice and cosy. It's a little bit snowy where I am at the moment and it's a bit chilly, but we're going to go over to Adelaide, Australia. So we're going to get ready to warm up. And, and listen to Renee Gibson tell a really inspirational story of how she's dealt with body confidence and having that resilience to, I guess, dust yourself off and just get back up again. When situations are quite difficult, I think you'll find this will be a real, a real inspiration for you. It's very real. Renee has, has had one of these, I guess lives where I feel that she's she's done everything she's you know she she traveled 30 countries by the time she reached 30 and I think that is you know I'm so jealous of that that, that is really amazing she had a honeymoon in Hawaii just a really quite a sparkly life and as you'll hear Renee in today's episode things took a little bit of a bit of a, a detour and I want today's episode to really speak to you and just let you realise that when things are difficult and when when you feel that there's nowhere else to go just further down, that that there is that inner resilience within us all that we can home into to pick us back up and to push forward and just to get through some really, really challenging times. And I'm keeping it real, you know, we're still in lockdown. It's still quite tricky for some people. But what I love about Renee's episode is her ability just to really just keep pushing through and pushing through when things are quite difficult and when we talk about mindset you know it's a word isn't it but I think when you hear Renee explain a weight loss story and how she's been able to to manage that in difficult circumstances and how when health problems came upon her family she was able just to dig deep and, and get through it all. And I think that's what we all need to do. Whatever whatever the situation is and whatever our big thing is, and this is what Renee touches on, whatever our big thing is, it's difficult, isn't it? When we're in it, it's, it's difficult. And we've, we've all got things that, that come up that we find challenging. But we also have within us that ability just to stand up when we feel that there's nowhere else to go. And I'm, I'm sure that there'll be people listening to this that have other things going off, not just weight loss, not just wanting to commit to the fitness, that they have health concerns, maybe they've they've been ill with COVID and, and are wondering how to push through and, and to remain positive in those difficult times. This is a real touching episode. And when you hear Rene talk in such a, a lovely, bright optimistic narrative I think it'll make you realise and give you hope that that's the thing there's always hope there's always hope even when we think we can't do any more in terms of our weight loss because of Covid we can't do the fitness thing because the gyms are closed we can't we can't we can't when actually when we stand back and we look at the whole picture the whole story the whole thing that we're telling ourselves there's always possibilities is introducing Renee Gibson to her episode of Slimming Stories. So Renee, bless her, has agreed to come on to the show and she's put the little one to bed. So it's all nice and calm. It's 9pm at the moment where Renee is. And we have to be so organised, don't we, at the moment with, with children and childcare. And often the childcare that isn't there, we have to be really, really careful about how we arrange our time and make sure that we take that time as well for ourselves. Yeah, 100%. It's 
it's interesting times having having a one year old in these times. And um, yeah, we we don't use childcare, so we rely on family. And um, yes, so it's very much about being strategic. And I know I sent you certain times that I could do because they're the only times that he he's sleeping. So yeah, plan ahead and hope for the best. And I know that you're working from home at the moment. So how is that with the little one? How is it to manage, obviously, friends coming in and, and family and then and that support? Do you feel that you can focus on your work? How is it for you? Yeah, it's been really interesting because I went back from maternity leave at the end of October. So I've only been back a month. And a couple of days a week, I actually go and stay at my mum's house and sleep there for a couple of nights. And she has my little boy um, throughout the day. And that is actually working pretty well, but it is hard when I can hear that he's, you know, he's teething, so he's having a bad day or something and I'm in a meeting and I can hear (sighs) that, oh, oh, I just want to go give him a cuddle, but I can't. So, so it's definitely not ideal, but at the same time, we're so lucky and COVID or not, we wouldn't be able to utilize childcare because my husband is immunocompromised. Um, and childcare is full of germs yeah. so we're we're very lucky to have that family support brilliant yeah that that child care it sounds great doesn't it but you really want to get your child mixed in with lots of other children especially <laughs> when they're teething they're just like monsters yes. aren't they they just want to get the you know the hands on to everything they want to buy everything in the property that I used to live in with my little one when I was a single parent I, I own that house I rent it out there's still teeth marks of where my son used to <laughs> bite onto, onto the window frame. It's like, yeah, they, they do turn into little monsters. So I'm glad you've got yeah. that, that covered. He's a very good little boy, except he does <laughs> like biting, including me. So that's, oh. that's a fun challenge we're going through at the moment. <laughs> that's a whole new podcast. <laughs> so the reason I've invited you on, Renee, is, you know, you've, you've listened to a couple of the episodes. I generally do cover a lot about transformation stories and how people have gone through difficult times and and they've learned a lot and they've had this this great success and the reason that I find your story really interesting is to me <laughs> somebody sat in the UK it was really interesting to see that you you chose the UK for your gap year I mean I couldn't imagine anything more grim <laughs> the UK isn't beautiful but yeah you chose to have the UK is your gap year in study and, and looking through the information that you send about what happened in your life. It, it feels quite, I don't know, I've said before, didn't I, but before you came on, that it was a bit like every box was ticked. It seemed like quite a sparkly life to have. And I just wanted to, to bring you on just to show what can happen when things don't always go to plan and how you can build resilience and just get through those tough days. Because I know that there are people listening to this that are feeling, you know, 2020 has been a full on, a full on year. And how can I get through or even face the next year? And I thought it'd be nice just to, to have you on and just to tell us about your weight loss story and the challenges that you've had. So the gap year in the UK, how was that yeah. for you? It was amazing. So I grew up, my dad was born in Loughborough. So I've got a British passport. I grew up, I wanted to go to university in the UK. That was my dream. And then I had a boyfriend in high school and things changed. And long story short, that relationship ended, but I got to the end of high school and had always envisioned going to the UK as soon as I finished high school. So I moved to London, lived with my auntie, worked in a couple of pubs, moved to Nottingham and worked in a pub there. Did a Kentucky tour through uh, Europe, which I think is a fairly Aussie thing to do. (laughs) And was kind of in England and traveling for about eight months and then got really homesick and came home. So came home and started uni a couple of months later. Right. And I was so, I was not yeah. for you. I, I'm from Nottingham, so Oh, there you <laughs> go. I was wondering where that accent was from. I loved it. I made a, a couple of really good friends. The pub that I worked in was really a really great environment to be and it was great. My auntie and uncle 
were actually from Australia, uh, were working as teachers there. And so I kind of crashed on their couch for a few months and worked in a pub. And yeah, it was good fun. I just thought it was amazing that there's a street called Maid Marion Way. Like <laughs> it was like living in a storybook. <laughs> oh, lovely. And it's lovely that you've yep. got the family in, in the UK yeah. and you, you know, obviously you have that yearning, that yearning to go back and, and the travel, did it just stop in the UK or did you continue that throughout Europe? No. So, um, yeah, I traveled a bit throughout Europe and then when I came home, um, I studied for a couple of years, had another gap year kept studying for a couple more years but throughout my 20s I got to the point where I ended up traveling a lot I moved and lived in Beijing when I was 27 and taught there because my background is teaching and I actually ended up setting myself the goal to travel to 30 countries before I turned 30 and I did that a couple of months before I turned 30 and then like you said (laughs) A lot of stuff's happened since then and I haven't been to any more countries. I'm now 36, so I won't be hitting 40 before 40 because uh, I don't think any of us are travelling very much at the moment. No, but no. that's something that I feel so grateful and privileged to have been able to do because it's not something a lot of people can do is travel that extensively. Um, but certainly having lived in Beijing, I lived there for three years and was teaching and as soon as the school holidays came like us teachers would actually take our luggage to school on the last day and go straight to the airport um, and go on holidays so I got to travel a lot from there as well you know throughout China and then Japan and Korea and um, Malaysia the US all sorts it's kind of a good location to be able to move on from so I've had some great travels. That just sounds like the dream. And I was talking about yeah. the box. I mean, that, you know. Yes. <laughs> before you're 30, that, that's amazing. And the fact that, you, you know, you took your backpack with you to school, that is, just, I can't imagine that happening in the UK. I think we're just too yeah. prim and proper. We're like, no, we need to get back, sort the house out first, iron the clay. I know. Yeah, it sounds the dream. It was a pretty amazing lifestyle. We were very lucky and privileged, yeah. With everything that you've explained there, I can't imagine that you would have had an issue with your weight and how you were. At what Mm. point did you feel that you wasn't quite comfortable? I'm 5'11", so I'm relatively tall, but I was always bigger as well. And when I look back on photos of myself in school and stuff, I was a regular body size, like an Australian 12 to 14. But... I always felt bigger. I was always a bigger person in my year level or whatever. Um, but then my gap year, working in pubs, uh, drinking a lot of beer and uh, eating a lot of food. I'm half English, but I'm also half Italian. So we love our food. And so, yeah, when I got home from my gap year and started university when I was 19, I just wasn't comfortable in my body and my stepmother introduced me to Weight Watchers and we went along to Weight Watchers together and that's when I first lost weight. I had started at about 91 kilos, forgive me for speaking in kilos, and lost uh, 20 kilos and and that was my goal, my WW goal, Weight Watchers goal and I hit lifetime which meant I maintained it for like six weeks but the way that I went about weight watchers and weight loss back then was it was a job I had to do it was something not to be ashamed of but like it was just I didn't like going to meetings I just I, it was embarrassing but I went I weighed in I didn't like people seeing my numbers or anything um, and then once it was done it was done it was like a hidden shame and I didn't go to meetings after that so of course traveling and uh working as a teacher and finishing my studies as a teacher and really struggling with like my anxiety and stuff throughout that time in those first few years of teaching, all that weight kind of came back on. And I lived in Beijing and then I came home and did some more studies with my master's. I'd put on all the weight and more. I was over a hundred kilos. I met my husband and, um, we were traveling and uh, I was in, I'd gotten really into like 
makeup and dressing kind of retro and I've always felt like a really photogenic person and then I'd started seeing photos of myself and at my in-law uh, sister-in-law's wedding and stuff and I just was like oh I don't like that photo but I was dressed up and and mm. I was like oh I don't like that 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 doesn't look like me and I didn't recognize myself yeah. and that's when I realized actually I'm exhausted walking up staircase I won't even run to catch the train when I'm 20 meters away I'm not living a healthy life I've met the man I want to spend my life with and I want to have a family with but I, I can't even look after myself how can I look after a family you know how can I expect my if we have a family how can I expect my child to be healthy if I'm not modeling that and so something clicked in me and then I decided to start my Instagram and and lose the weight and rejoin uh, Weight Watchers because I knew it would work for me. And I think both Weight Watchers and Simming World are now working a lot more around the the mindset piece Mm. in particular I feel that Weight Watchers is quite interestingly not focusing as much on the actual number on the scales and my understanding is now with a Weight Watchers group is that you can attend a, a group and not weigh that is your choice is that is that correct? I believe so I do it online now um, but very much and that's why they've changed their name so they go by WW now right. to kind of I mean it still signifies Weight Watchers but they don't don't call themselves Weight Watchers anymore um, to really try and remove that weight as being the focus and now well-being is the focus and so actually we just got an app update and it's very much about goals and and mindset and like meditation and all those things are kind of um, built into the program now and I think that is a really that's a really good thing and that's why I'm quite an advocate for the program and really believe in it because I have really struggled with social anxiety specifically in the past and I think and that has a lot to do with my weight struggles as well and so being able to focus not on just my weight but on everything else that makes me well and healthy is really good and I guess and I didn't mention it before but when I did lose those 20 kilos the first time when I was 19 I didn't exercise once right when I did it again um, a couple couple of years ago before my pregnancy I lost 20 kilos I walked every single day and that did more for my well-being than losing than eating well and losing the weight you know it was it was about that whole body wellness I think I feel Mm. that I've been in a situation where I've I've done the runs I've done the 5k I've built up to a 10k but walking for me has always been super important so as you know having been to this area it's surrounded Mm. by forests and woods and from a very young age I used to go for walks with my granddad and my mum and my dad and aunties and uncles, wherever it happened to be there, through the local woods. And it wasn't a case of, oh, you know, she's four, she's five, she's not going to go for a long walk. It would be a case of that I would go for the long walks. And if I got really, really tired, and I'd go on somebody's shoulders or I'd, I'd, you know, I'd moan and I'd get like a leg and a wing and things like that. <laughs> uh, but they always made it, they always made it fun. So... I just think when I go for a walk, it's, you know, it's such a therapy. And I imagine that where you're living, there's lots of beautiful, beautiful walks that you can take yourself on and just get away from that noise. Just block it out. Yeah, I I did today, actually. I took my little boy and pushed him along the foreshore. And so it was a beautiful day. It was about 28 degrees today. Um, wow. which is <laughs> which is hot but it's going to be 38 on Friday so it's not that oh hot <laughs> um, right. and there was a sea breeze and the sunshine and the ocean right there and so that is something I've always loved living near the ocean um, and being able to walk along it really grounds me and or along 
anywhere actually that there's nature, but particularly I've got a soft spot for the ocean. See, I have to pay for an app on my phone to hear a sea breeze and you've got it there <laughs> on your doorstep. I'm not saying that I'm jealous. I'm not saying that, but I am. Uh, I am. I mean, it must, uh, be, it must be amazing yeah. to have that on your doorstep. And for your children as well, you know, the whole family life of, of being near the sea, that the, you know, the therapeutic process of that and the walks must be. Mm. Must be a yeah, godsend. it's wonderful. I missed it when I lived in Beijing because it's just buildings for miles, mm. you know. And I'd come home and just go to the ocean and just kind of look out and there'd be nothing. I mean, there's plenty under the water, but nothing for as far as the eye can see was pretty amazing. So having travelled in your 20s and having had all those experiences and I knew that you went on to meet your, your husband and it all sounds still quite rosy at this, at this point. <laughs> it does sound very, very pretty and very rosy. And how was it to meet somebody having lost that weight and having had those experiences? How was your, your body confidence at the point that, that you met your husband to be? So I met my husband. I just moved back to Australia when I was 30. And I was like, right, I'd been single my entire 20s. And I was like, right, I, I'm willing to meet someone now. I'm willing to share my life with someone. But this was when I was about 100 kilos. So I was quite confident. I was really into like the body positivity movement on Instagram. I dressed vintage, um, which is very flattering. And I wore a full face of makeup every day. I had platinum blonde hair. And so I was really in a fairly confident place. And I met my husband and it was amazing. But then I guess... Time went on and like I said, I just started to lose that sense of confidence. I don't I don't really know why or how, but all of a sudden I'd been I think I'd been with my husband, my partner at the time, for a couple of years and I just didn't feel like myself anymore. Nothing to do with him. I just I didn't look like myself and I was like, "Mm, this this just doesn't feel right. And it was nothing, I mean he still loved me. He, th- he thought I was awesome, but I didn't feel right. And maybe I'd, you know how they say you get really comfortable yeah. when, when you get into a long-term relationship, maybe that was something to do with it. I don't know, but I was like, right, something needs to change. And he was always um, a lot fitter with, than me. He'd come home from work and go for a run and I would not have the energy to do anything like that. I've never been a runner. And so maybe that played into a little bit as well that he was kind of the fit one and I just wasn't there and I wanted to start a family. And I'd grown up, I guess, and my parents, like we weren't people that went for a walk in the woods or um, anything like that. They made me do, they made me choose a sport that I had to be doing. And so I did basketball for a term. I did netball for a few years. I did tennis for a term and I just never was a sporty person because it was always you go do this rather than us do it Mm. together and I wanted to be a mum that was fit and active with her child and was able to model that healthy lifestyle with her child that's when the penny dropped for me I think and it's so important to try and be a healthy weight at the point that you conceive because Mm obviously the pounds go on and if you're already feeling a bit sluggish and uncomfortable you don't want that do you and obviously in a blue sky world when you're when you're pregnant so what steps did you take at that point having done the Weight Watchers plan did you feel Mm. that you could go back to that was that the first step of of recognizing that you could do something or take this action and that would work yeah I think I don't know which came first chicken or egg but I think I started somehow stumbled across some Weight Watchers on YouTube or Instagram or figured out that there was a community out there. And then all of a sudden I was like, right, that's it. I'm signing up and I'm starting an Instagram because I don't want to go back to meetings. I don't have the time. I I was working in a pretty busy, still my job now, but a fairly busy job. And I didn't, I, I didn't want an excuse to start skipping meetings. I wanted to kind of tailor 
the WW program to myself. And so I thought if I join digital, I start an Instagram and that will be my group. That will be my Weight Watchers meeting where I weigh in every week. I tell my followers, <laughs> even if it's only myself, um, how much I've lost and what I'm doing and what I'm focusing on eating and really tap into the community to try and find recipes and inspiration and and it worked it was really amazing hmm. so with the newfound confidence of you your weight loss and uh, with hmm. your partner there and and everything kind of ticking on nicely I know that you, you went on to get married so how long was it after you met that you actually made the made that leap so <laughs> let me do the maths um we met in 2015 and we got married at the end and end of 2018 so three and a half years we'd known each other yes we got married we had a very small wedding um, with just our parents and siblings and a few close friends because I didn't really need a big to-do I just wanted to be married to him so yeah we got married in the December and went on our honeymoon to Hawaii and yeah and found out we were pregnant in February amazing and at that mm. point you'd lost your weight hadn't you so you mm-hmm. was at your ideal weight again yep you was married or what I mean Hawaii I can't even begin yeah. to think <laughs> of how those you know those photos would have looked I mean that's that's just if any you know if you could pick any any place for a honeymoon that must have been just sheer delight sheer delight yeah it it was amazing we we loved it but I guess like I said, my husband's always been the fit one. And so we had planned all these hikes and walks. And um, then uh, he had actually been a little bit unwell in the lead up to the wedding. We didn't know why. He had a cough. And then on honeymoon, we went on these hikes and I would be marching up the hill and he would, he was coughing and and really, really struggling. And it just we kind of brushed it off because we didn't really know what was going on. And we just thought that this cough or or like chest infection or something that he'd had the months leading into the wedding must have really impacted his fitness. But long story short, when I was 10 weeks pregnant, so in March, 2019, we found out that he had cancer. He had blood cancer, a type of blood cancer called myelodysplastic syndrome. So he was short of breath because he didn't have enough red blood cells running around his body. So that's why. Um, but yeah, it certainly, it didn't put a dampener on the honeymoon, but it did kind of, it was a, a, a weird thing. And in hindsight, looking back on it, it's like, oh yeah, you were really, really sick. That's why yeah. you couldn't get up the hill. So mm. you've got yourself into this situation where you was at the best health that you'd been in a while. Mm. You'd lost the weight, felt fantastic, had this beautiful honeymoon, then found out you was pregnant and then your husband was mm. going through these health issues. So how did that affect your day-to-day routine in mm. terms of looking after yourself because you're pregnant and you need to be healthy and then dealing with your, your husband and his, his concerns and, and managing that? It was, it was tricky, you know, because he couldn't go for walks and stuff anymore. And so I felt a level of guilt going out for walks and, and exercising when he was going through such major things. So basically when we, when we did find out that he was unwell in March and I was 10 weeks pregnant, um, first of all, I hadn't even told my family that I was pregnant so that that was interesting calling my mum and saying I'm at the hospital Ben's it looks like Ben has leukemia and by the way I'm pregnant (laughs) um (laughs) but my poor mother um but yeah and then coming so coming home basically that said you know um he would need a stem cell transplant in in August uh if he didn't have that, he'd have two years to live max. Um, but if he did have that, he'd have kind of a maybe a 50% chance of having at least five years to live. And so when you're told that your husband is 
possibly going to die. It's like, oh, and you're having a baby. It's like, well, I need to look after myself because there's a baby inside of me. But, hey, people have babies every day, you know. Right now, my focus has to be on looking after my husband because the baby will be fine. And so I think that's kind of the approach I took. And I kind of did things sporadically. So we'd go through weeks where we'd have a huge sense of grief or even days where we'd have grief after seeing his doctor and being reminded of those statistics. But then life just goes back to normal for a few days until you see the doctor again, you know. And so we'd get out and he'd come out for walks. Like I said, we live near the beach and um, we'd get out and about and I would kind of sporadically be updating my Instagram kind of with healthy choices that I was eating. But then certainly uh, once my husband was admitted into hospital for a stem cell transplant when I was seven months pregnant and he was in hospital for six weeks and I'm still working full time, I was going to the hospital at 7.30 in the morning, having breakfast whilst spending a bit of time with him, walking to work because I worked near the hospital, working all day, coming back to the hospital in the afternoon or in the evening, um, eating dinner uh, there and then heading home at 8 or 9 o'clock at night every day uh, and then going in on the weekend as well um, when I was seven and eight months pregnant. And that was bloody hard. Mm. Excuse my Australianism, yeah. <laughs> but like it was really hard. But it was the only thing I could like. It was the only thing I could do. He was so sick and so sad, and being there, me being there, made him happier. And me being there made me happier, even though some days were horrible. I couldn't not be there, you know. And so that was really tricky in regards to my eating because. You know, I don't know how many of your listeners have been around someone that's going through chemo or significant cancer treatment, but they don't always love the smell of food and stuff like that. And so often I couldn't eat around him, especially being Italian, love garlic, um, (laughs) which which is a bit stinky uh, (laughs) and sometimes not appreciated when you're feeling horrible. And so... Uh, I'd often, yeah, get a quarter pounder from Macca's, McDonald's on the way home and or get breakfast on the way in because I hadn't had a chance to make my overnight oats or whatever. Mm. Um, so I was eating a lot of um, fast food and, and cheese toasties or whatever. Luckily, our family were also, our family and friends were amazing. They were filling my freezer with stuff, but sometimes it was just, it was survival mode, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, and certainly something I was talking to a good friend of mine about when you tell yourself that you should be doing things to look after yourself, then you just feel guilt about the fact that you're not doing them. Yeah. And so what I've been able to do in the last year, 18 months, two years, is teach myself to have a lot of kindness and grace for myself. And I think that's really where I'm at at the moment is, and that's something I really recommend to everyone listening, is sometimes you've just got to do what you can and let go of that guilt and that sense of what you should be doing and do what you can and anything else is a bonus. That's right. Okay? That's right. Yeah. And just, just listening to you talk through that story of events your husband's transplant has been has been a success and that weight knowing that has been the outcome must be it must be all of your Christmases that have come come at once I can't I can't imagine that the yeah the relief of, of that and knowing knowing that it's been a success it's one of those blood cancer is shit sorry to (laughs) it's one of those things where (laughs) where you have a transplant and forever we will say it's a success so far 
because any time a year down the track, two years down the track, 10 years down the track, his body can reject the transplant. But right now, it's a success. And we actually, our life, other than COVID, which is a whole nother story, especially when you're immunocompromised, but our life feels normal again, which which is amazing. So he still hasn't been able to go back to work yet because it takes a long time for your body to rebuild. But hopefully sometime in the new year, um, he'll be able to work towards that. And yeah, we, you know, I wish we didn't have to go through it, but certainly so incredibly grateful that that he had the the transplant because there's so many people that don't get that opportunity. There's not enough donors and um, not enough donor matches. So they would prefer to get family, but no one in his family was a match. And so then uh, we went on to the worldwide database and there was actually a few kind of partial matches. And so that's what he had. He had one his first donor and they could have gone again with his first donor um, because just because it didn't work the first time, it might've worked the second time, but they decided to go with someone else. So the fact that there's two complete strangers out there that have gone and donated their stem cells for him and for our family is amazing. And hopefully one day we'll be able to thank them. Just, yeah, it's just an incredible story. And at the point that all this has, has gone along obviously like you say you're grabbing at food you're going for your mcdonald's yes it's not really a priority that 110 percent agree it wouldn't be how Mm. did it look for you in terms of trying to eat well like you said you Mm. wanted to set a good example for for your son and when I laugh I don't I don't mean that that you know it's it's funny I mean it's just it's a crazy situation so you're trying to eat, eat well look after your family and then mm. you mentioned that in the information that you sent me that you, your husband needed to gain weight. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's, just, <laughs> it's just a crazy, it's a crazy yeah. scenario. And and you're just trying to, you know, you're a new mum. I mean, that in itself, that in itself is a challenge. Without everything else, you know, that, that you know, there should be awards for that in its, itself. And this was your, yeah, so this was your reality. So... How did you, in all of that, think about the mindset and the the self-care that you need to give yourself to think about eating well and getting your your weight loss on track? Yeah, well, I knew that I was, in a way, holding the family together, uh, you know, and... uh, I just needed to keep myself healthy as a priority because as soon as I wasn't healthy, who would do it? Who would get everything done, you know? So um, after having Robbie uh, when he was six weeks old, I rejoined WW and kind of re kickstarted and was doing my best. But like I said, my husband, <laughs> my husband finally had an appetite to eat and also was told by the dietitians at the hospital, your priority is eating. You don't have to worry about heart disease. You don't have to worry about diabetes. You already have cancer. You just need to put on weight. So you can eat cakes. You can eat bread, cheese, fried food. You have to put on weight because he also still had to eat a low immunity diet, which means he couldn't eat, you know, lots of salads and cold chicken and, you know, relatively healthy stuff or pre-cut fruit or anything um he was actually told to eat as many baked goods as he liked and so and my family and friends knew this and so they're (laughs) delivering all these baked goods and I'm like (laughs) because that is all I wanted to eat so yeah it was tricky but again with kindness so I thought I would do my best. I was breastfeeding. So within Weight Watchers, you can be breastfeeding and it gives you loads of extra points. So actually I was able to pretty much um, eat almost what I liked and still stay within that point. So it was only when my son um, started 
eating less from me and eating more of his own food that it started being a bit trickier because the amount of smart points that I could eat or food within Weight Watchers dramatically dropped. But I guess, again, and I was thinking about it now, like I'm still not perfect. I've only lost eight kilos since kind of rejoining last year, but that's okay. It's amazing that you've lost eight kilos. You've held it all together mentally. You've held it all together for everyone. And you've lost eight kilos, which let me just have a stick. So that's a stone... Let's have a look, 17 and a half pounds. Yes, we've had a dramatic year, but everyone has. And I mean, uh, as far as COVID goes, we're having a little bit of a challenge at the moment in South Australia, but actually South Australia has gone really well. And when I look to places like the UK or the US or um, I've got friends all over the world and their lockdowns have been really, really tricky and Mm. it's really hard to get motivated when you can't get out and you know one of the ways that I really been motivated in the past especially to exercise is to get out there with friends to go for walks and make sure that instead of going out for lunch with friends we would go for walks and a coffee or something and having that taken away from us this year or as a new mum or you know COVID aside when you don't have that support network, it makes it that extra layer of trickiness. It adds an extra layer of trickiness for everyone. And so it doesn't matter if you haven't got a husband with cancer, it's still hard year, you know? (laughs) And so my husband and I say to each other, everyone's big is big to them. And that's really important for us to, because it doesn't matter if, And you've talked about this, I think, I can't remember who your guest was, but I was listening and they had lost a small amount of weight compared to some of your other listeners. And it's really important that it doesn't matter how much weight you want to lose. It doesn't matter what challenges you have in your life. It's big to you. It's important to you. Hmm. And if you're having struggles with motivation, then that's a big thing to you that you know, it can weigh on you. And so it's important no matter what you're going through to treat yourself with kindness and to get up and try again the next day and the next day. And I think that's what I'm really proud of this year is that, yeah, I've only lost the eight kilos, but I'm maintaining. I'm not, you know, if I delete the app and removed myself from Instagram because everyone else's success stories were too good and and I couldn't relate well then it would slowly balloon and so I'm really proud of myself for just continuing to chip away I know I'll get there you know and it's just about keeping on track and connected to the community and that's what I love about Instagram is that there are WWs and Slimming World people that all come together and share their stories and it, you can be having a shit day and then you kind of before you go to bed or in the morning you have a look through and you're like oh that recipe looks good or oh that person's gotten up and gone for a walk I should really go for a walk as well or you know Amy who is a an Australian WW ambassador actually but she was living in London during the lockdown she was immunocompromised and living in a little courtyard home in London and she didn't like half marathon doing laps of her courtyard and I was like first of all you're (laughs) amazing and there's no way I would do that but if you can do that then I can bloody walk around the block you know and so it's I love that about about the online community and so it's so warm so good and and nurturing and everything that you've just said it's just so 100% humbling that you know when you say that everyone's big is 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 big and and you and your husband have sat down and 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 recognize that that is you know I, I feel so humbled just to to hear that you've both been through this incredible and I don't want to say journey but journey (laughs) (laughs) yeah and and you've got that 
that mindset that you recognize that other people are struggling in lockdown and I know that everyone that's going to listen to this podcast will be super inspired by everything that you've had to say and if anybody would like to follow you and your journey <laughs> <laughs> how can they find you on Instagram you can find me at healthy underscore Ren R-E-N lovely on Instagram I think you'll find that people will be coming to follow you because <laughs> how, how can people not be inspired by your journey and I know that you've had the little one and you've had work and it's getting quite mm-hmm. late so yes yeah, so I just want to thank you for so so much for all of your honesty and it's been really important just to get you on to to give people that hope really that even when you're on literally on the floor and there's nowhere to go but under you can find it within yourselves to, to start to, to stand up and just take on those challenges and in covid this conversation has been really really important it's been really it's been really golden and i'm, I'm so grateful that you've, you've come on today oh thank you so much for having me it's been my pleasure you're welcome you I, take hope, care. I hope my story helps someone <laughs> it will it will it's helped me it's helped me oh, and i know good. that my listeners will really yeah will really love love to hear this oh, thanks claire thank you everyone you're welcome talk about resilience I mean this woman really is something else isn't she as a young mum having been there and listening to to Rennie's story back and and all of those those concerns that you have those anxieties as a mum those natural things that you do because you don't know what you're doing you know you don't get a manual when you have a when you have a baby and then taking on board everything that came Renee's way and with with a family and her husband's health and getting through that, she really is just something else. I think every episode that I've done with with the ladies in Australia has it's just been fantastic. And resilience is is something, isn't it? It's a word, but she really just personifies everything that resilience stands for. And I really do wish Renee all the success going forward with with anything that she she hopes and dreams for. I know she's spoke about getting to 40 countries by the time she's 40 you never know you just never know what's around the corner because this woman I do feel can can really do anything and I hope that this has inspired you just to just to see that there is that ability to stand back reassess dust off whatever crap has come your way (laughs) and just focus and get through the day take it you know one day at a time in COVID, if COVID is something that has really affected you, affected your mindset, affected just feeling a bit glum, a bit heavy, just to think, you know, what can I do today to shift that? What can I do to change things up so that today's not the same as yesterday? And that thing could just be taking the pressure off. So when I say to you, what thing can you do? It's not me giving you a task to think, right, okay, what can I do? What do I need to do? Do I need to put the steps in? Do I need to do a new recipe? Do I need to get a journal and start writing a thousand pages? It, that, it's, that isn't what I'm saying. What I'm saying to you is try something different. And that different thing could be watching something new on Netflix, you know? If what you need to do is just chill out on a sofa watching Netflix and zoning out, then I think that is self-care in COVID because you're allowing yourself just to invite some creativity into your home by watching a new drama, a new movie. Maybe it's a movie that's going to inspire you. Maybe it's something that you've wanted to do for ages, but you've not because you've not taken that time for yourself. And taking time for yourself doesn't just have to be going out for a walk or, or reading a book. It could simply be something that is really, really self-indulgent and rich that really, really fills you up. I hope you're well. I hope, however this episode finds you, that you're okay. That you're okay. I'm okay. Are you okay? If you're not okay, DM me. Reach out if you feel that it's a bit heavy and for whatever reason you can't push through, whatever reason that may be. I'll send you a virtual hug. I'm looking out of the window as I'm recording this. 
It's quite dark and I won't be going outside today, for sure. I won't be going outside. Once I've edited this podcast, I'll be chilling out on the sofa. I'm going to light a candle, put the fire on, perhaps watch a bit of a Bake Off, some old episodes that really lifts me up, and, and then do some creative artwork. That's what I'm doing for today. And I'm also going to do a nice rice dish. I like to experiment in the kitchen, and that's my thing. And I'm sure your thing is totally different, but whatever you're doing... Wishing you a fantastic week ahead. And until next time, take care.